If you would, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 5. That's where we'll get started, Exodus 5. We're going to try to make it through the whole chapter, and y'all bear with me. Yeah, you already talk slow. When I talk fast, it's still slow. I talk slow and I hear slow. At any rate, if you've got an Exodus 5, if you would bow your heads. And Father, we just do thank you, Father. We thank you for the burden you've placed on Hector and uh, his family. And Lord, we just look forward to seeing what you're going to do here through uh, prayer. Lord, and hearing the testimonies and, and just getting people really excited about this. The greatest tool we have in our toolbox, and it's the one we so rarely ever pull out of that box and use, um, especially in a vigorous manner. But Father, we thank you for that. And so, Lord, we ask you to be with us today to anoint the Word. Uh, we know you've already anointed the worship, Father. And we just ask you to be with us as we go through this service, Father. Soften our hearts and open our ears, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, when God gave Moses his plan for delivering his people, it basically had two different phases in it. The first phase we've already seen, which was where he was to meet with the elders of Israel and to get everyone on the same page, and that actually came off, we read last week, without a hitch. The second phase of the plan was to approach Pharaoh and let him know that the Hebrews needed a few days off work in order to go into the desert and worship God. And as we're about to see, that did not come off well. It didn't happen at all. And what I want you to do as we go through this story is try to put yourself in the place of Moses in the sense that there's so many things in our lives, even the things in which we are sure are ordained of God, those things in which we are sure are ordained of God still don't, most of the time in my experience, come off without a hitch. All right? Resistance in life is as sure as death and taxes. All right? So how do we deal with that? Well, we're going to answer that today by looking at how Moses dealt with it and how God dealt with Moses as well as Israel. And you can rest assured that our God of grace will deal with you in not maybe not exactly the same manner, but the same basic manner as we go through this. Look at verse 1. It says, Afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey His voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So chapter 5 starts out with Moses approaching Pharaoh, telling him that the Lord God of Israel said, Let my people go. Now, in order to, to not fall into the trap of so many people in which we just kind of read over the narrative and you kind of blow through it, you have to stop and try to put yourself in the situation to really appreciate the gravity of what's happening here. Moses just went in to the king's residence or the palace, the hall, whatever, wherever he's holding court. The most powerful man in all of that region, the most powerful man in the most powerful nation of that region, he goes into the king's residence, he obtains an audience with the king, and then he tells the king, a king who thinks of himself as the incarnation of Horus man who thinks of himself as God or as a God, he tells that man who thinks of himself as a God that his God, that Moses' God, that is an order. He tells him what his God has said. My God is giving you, you crazy narcissist who thinks you're a God, has given you an order, let my people go. And of course, you're sitting there watching this, Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner. And you can just see, you can cut the testosterone with a knife. Because when both of them are going to rooster up, that's what men do. You're not going to tell me, you're not going to come in my house and tell me what to do. And, and, and Charlton Heston, yeah, I'm Charlton Heston, and God told me to tell you. And so all of a sudden, that's where we find ourselves. You can see the pride welling up here in Pharaoh. Nobody's going to come in there and tell him what to do. And he's not about to let his free labor force leave. Especially, and he's especially not going to be told that by a man who comes from one of the slaves. And that's how Moses, we know Moses' story, but he's coming with Aaron, who was a slave. He's a, he's a Hebrew. He 
He's going to let him come in. I'm not, and you're, certainly you aren't going to come in here and tell me that. And on top of this, on top of this Moses has the nerve um, to come in here and threaten him with the words of a God that Pharaoh does not acknowledge. Now, he, he's heard of Yahweh because the Israelites have been in the land for all this time. He knows who Yahweh is, but you're, this is a, a paganistic culture, not the Israelites, but the rest of them, they're used to having gods all over the place. Everybody has a handful of them. This one is in charge of the harvest. This was in charge of the rain. This was in charge of that ditch. This was in charge of this river. This one's in charge of that mountain. That's the world in which they live. So he's, he's heard of Yahweh before. All right? It's not that he hasn't heard of him. But I, Pharaoh said, I don't acknowledge him, so you're not going to come in here and tell me that he says this particular thing and get me to jump. That's not going to cut any cake in here. That's essentially what's happening. So Pharaoh, while like I said, he had heard of Yahweh, his pride's not going to let him cow down to the God of a bunch of slaves, especially when he considers himself to be a God. As we say back home, that, that dog just won't hunt. It's just not going to work. But even beside the issue of pride, there's another principle at work. You've got to ask yourself this. As a Christian, a New Testament Christian looking back at this, we need to ask ourselves, can we really expect this pagan king to understand what the Hebrews wanted or why they were asking? On the surface level, you can understand. Yeah, you can understand. But when you invoke deity into the matter, I don't necessarily think you can't expect Pharaoh to just go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Romans 8. 5 through 8 says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, or it's in battle against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And Pharaoh walked according to the flesh. Now, he wasn't subject to the law of God because technically the law and its formalities haven't been introduced yet. I understand that. But at the same time, the principle is that, that Pharaoh is not following the will of God for he didn't know God. Knew of him, didn't know him personally. Big difference. I know of George Washington, never met the man perfect, uh, personally. All right? Pharaoh will know the God eventually of the Hebrews, but he have yet to be formally introduced. So this request to Pharaoh was foreign in a number of ways. It's just, what, what do you, I mean, I, he's, he might as well have been speaking Chinese when he came in. What, what are you talking about? No. No, you cannot go. And as the word of God that we are supposed to be carrying with us, as well as the lifestyles we are to live as witnesses to others, is foreign to those around us that walk in the flesh, or at least it's supposed to be. If our lifestyles aren't foreign or different to them, then we may want to ask why. Why do we blend in so well to, with them? Now, Israel is being moved out of Egypt and set up as a nation, and this is part of the plan, is that God's Word and the name of Yahweh can then be set apart and shown to all the nations that have been disinherited from God back in the book of Genesis. And so they are supposed to stand out and be different and draw people to them. Now that doesn't happen in the right way historically. They essentially uh, circle the wagons and do their own thing. But that is the purpose for them coming out of Egypt and being given their own land. As individuals, we as Christians are to stand out as others, also, uh, stand out to others also. Not necessarily because we look weird, Please don't go around looking weird. Of course, that changes. I understand. What is normal now was definitely weird back in my day. Uh, we're not supposed to, we're not necessarily to stand out because we look weird, but because we are modest in our dress and our speech, because we can carry on a conversation without dropping four letter words and F bombs all over the place. We stand out because we want to go to church and worship. Because Sunday mornings, our neighbors see us getting up and, and getting in the car, heading to somewhere other than the lake or the golf course or the shooting range or whatever the case may be. We would rather worship than find other things to do on Sundays. These things, amongst others, are to set us apart. 
And we can't make a statement to others regarding how God has changed our lives by blending in with aspects of our culture that don't honor God. So Israel is being pulled out of this so that they do stand out. Pharaoh is just doing what naturally comes to the natural man. That is his response. But We've been born again, and to whom much is given, much is required. Look at verse 3. So they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us, and this is Moses and Aaron now speaking once again to Pharaoh, Please let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmaster, taskmaster, that's always a hard word for me to say, taskmasters. I don't say taskmasters taskmasters, but it's taskmasters. Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. You shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men, that they may labor in it, and let them not regard false words. And the taskmasters of the people and their officers went out and spoke to the people, saying, it says spoke. They did not say, would you all come here, please? Let me just relay to you what Pharaoh has said. It says spoke. They yelled at him, you know, obviously. Went out and spoke to the people, saying, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go get yourselves straw where you can find it. Yet none of your work will be reduced. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters forced them to hurry, saying, Fulfill your work, your daily quotas, when there was straw. Also the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as before? Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why are you dealing thus with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants, and they say to us, Make brick. And indeed your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, Pharaoh here, You are idle, idle. Therefore you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Therefore go now and work, for no straw shall be given you. Yet you shall deliver the quota of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble after it was said, You shall not reduce any bricks from your daily quota. Now, ancient papyri have been found where it showed the quota of bricks being given. It's from a little later than than the Exodus. But um, vaguely, every man was required to make 200 bricks per day. Most of them fell slightly short of this. But you can see them tallying. And so there's a lot of logistics that goes into this, into building this, these sorts of things. Every pharaoh had a list of public works projects he wanted to accomplish before he died. Each one tries to outdo his predecessor, whether it's in conquest, in building you know, pyramids or statues or temples or what have you. It's just another way in which they felt that their names could live on forever. You know, every. Everybody will see for generations. It's kind of like going to a communist nation and seeing Stalin or Mao or, or Putin or whoever or, or Hussein, some of those guys, statues of them and, and their pictures all over the walls. That's kind of what living in Egypt was like. Egypt had been built on a combination of slave labor and conscripted labor. Slave labor, that's easy to, to, to figure out. Conscripted labor is where they go and find, you know, bunch of boys out in the country don't have anything better to do or don't have much work, and they pay them a little bit, bring them back into town, and put them there on the, on the site and, and work them like a bar and mule. At this particular time in Israel's history, uh, Egypt's history, they were in a great decline, which made them even more dependent on, on uh, slave labor than the conscripts because you have to pay conscripts, and there's not a lot of money. The tax base is, is not there. It wasn't there anymore. The, the um, golden years under Joseph uh, were now gone. But in the, 
In verse 3, Moses stated that God commanded that they go three days into the wilderness to worship. So that's three days out, a day to stay there and worship, and three days back, which gives you a whole week of lost labor. Now, no boss wants to lose a week's labor for free. I mean, this is going to cost him all. It's going to cost him more than whatever anybody he was getting paid. Losing everything. Especially, you've got to understand, that the kingdom couldn't run without its slaves. And they outnumber the Egyptians. So think about that. The majority of the population of the kingdom will be gone for an entire week. And then, with them leaving... Some of that is contingent on them actually coming back. What if they decided not to come back? What if they just like, hey, keep walking a little further, a little further, and a little further. And all of a sudden, the kingdom of Egypt shuts down. What's Pharaoh going to do? So from a pragmatic standpoint, if somebody's trying to run a kingdom, he has to say no. You see from that whole dialogue, if you're paying attention, that Pharaoh felt that the Hebrews had too much time on their hands. Great song from the group Sticks, one of the best they ever had, um, had too much time on their hands. And obviously, if they have time to conjure up this idea and ask for an entire week's vacation, they don't have enough to do. So we're going to fix that little, their little red wagon. We're going to pour it on. And they're going to have to keep up the pace of the labor without being brought the straw that they need to make bricks. Normally, you would have people out there, and their whole job was to go in with a sickle or what have you and cut straw. And then they bring it in on the, by the truckload, and somebody else cuts, chops it up in little pieces so that as they're mixing the mud, they s- sprinkle the, the straw in there and stir it all together. And two th- things happen. One, the fiber in the straw actually helps to hold the brick together. Two, as that decomposes, it uh, b- turns into an acid that actually makes the brick stronger. And mud brick, mixed with the right kind of straw, is actually three times stronger than just a regular brick. They're stronger than the bricks we have nowadays. All right? Which is why you've seen them there, you know, thousands of years later. So that's a big deal. And so you can't build these these gargantuan structures without the straw. But now a link in the supply chain has been taken out. There's here, you still got to build 200 bricks a day. Go out and find your own straw. Now, that's shooting yourself in the foot because they're going to go get grass or whatever laying around, not the right stuff, and they're not going to get it done. But this is pride butting heads right here. He's saying, look, you obviously don't have enough to do, so I'll fix that problem for you. And that's where we find ourselves. Pharaoh has now put the Israelites in an impossible situation. Now the Egyptians... You got to understand, they've been building things like this for centuries. They're well aware of the logistics that need to go on on a grand scale, and they're well aware of how much you could expect to get out of each man. They had all of this down to a science. So, Pharaoh had no inclination that they would be able to pull off this feat. He was simply sowing discord. He wanted to divide and conquer. He can't turn Moses into a martyr here. So the only thing he can do is turn the Hebrews on Moses in order to put an end to this whole fiasco. Look at verse 20. Then as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And they said, now this is the day that's coming out from Pharaoh. These are the the leaders uh, of the Hebrews. They, uh, They met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And they said to them, Let the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us aberrant, In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, you put a sword in their hand to kill us. Now, you see what's happened here. These Hebrews who just a few days earlier, when Moses comes in and starts talking to them, this is the plan, this is what we're going to do, and God's going to deliver us and all this. Yeah, that's groovy. We're on your side. You know, they've, they've got their signs up and everything, and they're happy. And now, after having been X number of days without their straw, now they're coming to Moses. You are a total moron. Look what you have done. So they, they've turned on Moses and Aaron. All the worship and all the words of support they'd given to Moses and Aaron in that initial meeting, those have gone by the wayside. Forgotten all that, you know. 
As soon as things got tough, they began to question whether or not Moses had really heard from God. And unfortunately, this is not an uncommon occurrence. Because if we're honest, we're all on God's side when things are going well. Just got a new job, got a raise, got a new house, got 2.8 children, or whatever it is, picket fence, got the car, got the pool, we're, everything is groovy. We're all on God's side when things go like that. We go to church, we carry our Bibles, we encourage others, we give our tithes and offerings. But then when things get tough and we find ourselves in the place where we need God and we need our church family the most, that's the time we tend to cut and run. Unfortunately, as a pastor, I've seen that all too much. When someone, when drama hits a family, when problems hit, hit a family, instead of coming here where they've got support and prayer and all that, out of shame or whatever the case may be, they tend to cut and run. And the, the, what people tend to say or think is, God failed me. Why is that? Well, in this case, in the case of Exodus here, it's because of the pain and suffering that's been placed on the people. It wasn't good before. They were slaves. But it wasn't this bad either. So everything has gotten harder. Things almost always get worse before they get better. Write it down. That's just the way it is. If every oppressed person throughout history has simply kept on with the status quo, there never would have been an American Revolution. There never would have been a civil rights movement. And so many other things. There's so many times you look at history at the great men or women, depending on leading some movement, especially... I as being a guy, I think of it this way. All the men who led some movement and it required so much of their time and energy over a sustained period of time that their wives and their families just kind of fall by the wayside or they get tired of it and say, you need to come home. And like, I, can't, I don't have an eight to five job. I'm leading the revolution. All those guys, if they had succumbed to that, and I'm not saying they should deny their family. I don't try to paint me in that corner. But what I am saying is if they had not made things worse before they, things had gotten better, then most of history would not have been accomplished. If you're really going to accomplish something, it, it takes a sacrifice. Like I said, there wouldn't have been a, an American Revolution or a Civil Rights Movement. And, we, and I ask myself this question, are all revolutions good? Well, I don't think so. I don't think the Russians or the Chinese would just say so. But the point is, that much of the time when you make major moves, you're going to upset the apple cart and someone is going to try to make things hard on you. And if you fold right then, because now my normal little routine from 8 to 5 is messed up, then nothing is ever going to get accomplished. Not in this world. Another mistake the Hebrews made was that they jumped the chain of command, so to speak. They should have, when they had all these issues gone straight to Aaron and Moses and said, hey man, they're really getting dropping the hammer on us here. You think you could do something? Intercede in prayer? Maybe call, talk to Pharaoh, go do something? They didn't do that. They went straight to Pharaoh. So now instead of going to the godly leadership, or the godly people in their own communities, and put it that way, I'm not, I'm not telling you come to me with all your problems. <laughs> no, don't do that. No. Phone rings enough as it is. Don't do that. But go to God with it. But the deal is, instead of doing that, they go straight to Pharaoh. They just go straight to a type of the enemy. And this is, uh, what, what, you know, prayer and encouragement were in order. That's what they really need from Moses and Aaron. That's what we all need when things get harder before they get better. Especially when they're getting harder before they get better because we're doing God's will. And then Moses, this kind of hits him, he's blindsided by this. He knew this part of the plan wasn't going to be easy. God's already told him way back in the desert, Pharaoh is not going to go for this. He's not going to take this lying down. This is going to be a fight, and it's going to take a little while. And I don't know if, if, if Moses relayed that truth to the, to the Israelites when he talked to them or not, but he himself should have at least known it's going to get bad before it gets better. And I can see Pharaoh right now looking out the, the, the curtains from the palace or peeping through the blinds 
At this now, he's got Aaron and Moses arguing with the other elders of Israel. I'm sure he was smiling as he had now successfully sown discord among the brothers. The strategy of divide and conquer was working at this point. Look at verse 22. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you have sent me? And I'm, you know, you're reading it and you go, Moses, he's already explained to this in the burning bush and you, he talked to you on the way over. Why are you asking such a silly question? But this is Moses' state of mind. Now it's, he's, get, he's getting hammered and all of a sudden, God, why did you send me? What in the world are you doing? Now Moses is tripping out. For, look at verse 23. Uh, for since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. Okay. It's at this point that Moses' humanity shows through once again. Because like most of us, Moses does the right thing. This is in general terms. Moses does the right thing and then the wrong, does the wrong thing in quick succession. Y'all probably don't do that. You do the right thing, and you continue doing the right thing throughout the day. No, if we're honest, most of the time we, we do the right thing, we do a good thing, and then we do something stupid in quick succession. Moses did the right thing in speaking to God and going and praying. That's what he's doing when he's talking to the Lord. He did the right thing there. G. Campbell Morgan says it this way, Happy is the man when he cannot understand the divine movement and indeed doubts it, doubts it has yet faith enough in God himself to tell him all his doubt. Tell God about his doubts. That's cool. Those who face men, having the right to say to them, Thus saith Jehovah, have all also the right to return to Jehovah and state the difficulties and expose openly their own doubts and fears. And what he's saying is, it's, it's great that we can go to God and express our doubts. It's great that we can talk to a bunch of people and then something, you know, everybody doesn't buy it. And then we go back to God and expose our, and, and, and talk to God about our doubts and the people's doubts. And that's what G. Campbell Morgan is saying. It's awesome. Moses did the right thing. But then he follows it up with something that he shouldn't have done. And none of us really can track our decisions and our actions in an easy manner. And what I mean is that we tend to grade our decisions and our actions, if you reflect on the day. And then it seems that we round up the score or round it down at the end of the day based on our overall feeling of how the day went. And then we tend to weight the, weight the good against the bad and grade on the curve. And, we do, and that's our spiritual grade for the day. You know. I didn't ask God to strike anybody driving slow in the fast lane today. That was a good day. No one gave me the number one driver award and I didn't give it to anybody else. It was a good day. And so we think, I've been a good Christian today. But that's not accurate at all. The truth is that we're constantly doing a good thing and then doing a bad thing. And we think good thoughts and then, then we think on something bad. And so we're in a constant state of flux. And we can see it here with Moses. And when the people confronted Moses, he turned to God. That's a good thing. But then when he began to talk to God, he didn't just express his doubts. He blamed God as if, as if he hadn't been, on the, been, been in on the plan from the beginning. You hadn't delivered them at all. And God was thinking, you know, flip back through a few pages. We've got a, you know, a lot of the conversation recorded here, Moses. Uh, you need to reread the contract, you know. God had told Moses, once again, that Pharaoh wasn't going to let them go without a fight. Moses must have known that Pharaoh wasn't going to take this lying down. This is nothing new. He had to expect some repercussions. And then when we get to this point, Moses folded like a cheap chair at the first sign of resistance. And maybe he wasn't expecting it from his own people. I don't know. But he had to have known it wasn't going to go smoothly. But the point is that he should have expected it because he had been warned. I think we all have short memories when it comes to God's promises. Our memories tend to be selective and nostalgic. I woke up this morning at 4 o'clock and uh, I was thinking about my mother and my first bicycle and uh, you know how, how neat that bike was, you know, and it was just awesome. But we didn't, I didn't get a bike from the store. 
we were walking down the road and my mother saw somebody throwing a bike off a bank into a creek. And she went down into the creek and dragged it out. And then all the other kids were like, what are you doing, Miss Fox? And she pushed that bike way back up that hill that seemed like Mount Everest as a kid, all the way back to the house, and she cleaned it up and, and put handlebars on it. I remember Daddy coming home one day from work with pedals, and he put, because it just had the rods on it. And that was my first bicycle. It's still hanging out behind uh, the shop. So I have fond memories of that, and I was thinking, oh, my first bike, that's awesome. And then, but when I started putting in context, and everybody else in the neighborhood had gone down to the Schwinn store or had a BMX, you know, I realized my memory was a little nostalgic, and it was. I mean, I, I, I just, the, the love Mama put into that bicycle. I thought about the old song, The Coat of Many Colors, that Dolly Parton and Emmy Lewis Harris, Emmy Lou Harris sang back in the 70s. I thought about that. But the point is, I had filtered out how it didn't quite meet the standards of all the other bikes in the neighborhoods. In the neighborhood, that's kind of how our memories are. We remember the good things and we tend to forget the bad. Or, in some cases, we remember the bad and tend uh, to forget the good. But this resistance from within the camp brought back the feelings of inadequacy that Moses had thought he left in Midian. See, because now he's meeting resistance. When everything's going, you're good. I can tell you from a football coach standpoint, you're winning, it's good. Then all of a sudden you meet up with this team and they beat you like a redheaded stepchild. And you you have you're five and zero, oh, and then they drum you, and you start doubting. What in the world have we done wrong? What did, what did we get wrong in the game plan? Moses probably now that he's met his resistance felt that he had outgrown those feelings because now the doubt comes in and it's personal. Maybe I'm not cut out to do this. Maybe I'm not the man to lead this group. Maybe I really didn't hear from God, even though he's constantly speaking with him. And it takes time to put all those things behind you. David Guzik, a good friend of mine, he, he says this, Moses probably thought that the dying to himself was finished after 40 years of tending sheep in Midian, but it wasn't. It never is. God still will use adversity to, to train us to trust him until the day we go to be with him in heaven. So biting the hand that feeds us can come rather naturally. And that's what Moses is doing right here. Look at verse 23. For since I came to Pharaoh and to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, neither have you delivered your people at all. Now Moses is hurt and scared. He is reacting instead of acting in faith. He's reacting instead of acting in faith. And now everything is God's fault. Obviously it can't be ours. When, everything, when anything goes wrong in my house, it's not my fault, I assure you. It's everybody else's fault. You know, you learn that whenever your children do something wrong, they take that from their mother's side of the family. It's very obvious, but that's the kind of way we think. These people, the Israelites, are suffering, and it's because, this is Moses thinking, these people are suffering, it's because you have failed to deliver them, God. You have failed, God you have failed. Moses followed his orders, but he's forgotten that this plan unfolds in waves. And that's because we tend to learn in waves. How many of us have been in this situation? How many of us have found ourselves in the line of fire from others and felt that God had let us down? Because after all, we're supposed to walk right in there, snap our fingers, say what God told us to say, and everybody gets saved. Everybody's on the same page. If you think that's the way it works, I want to invite you into the, a life in the week of a pastor. And you'll see this like herding cats. You don't just walk in and say it, and then everybody goes, oh, yes, divine one who has heard. No, it doesn't work that way. They're like, have you lost your mind? That'll never work. This is crazy. Most of us at one time have felt like God has let us down. I mean, that's, that's fine. But the truth is that we are critiquing many a times an unfinished product. And back when I had a job on the side painting houses, we had this lady that wasn't um, happy with the job, but she was critiquing an unfinished product. She'd only seen the first coat. And she came in wondering why you could see spots here and there. I said, it's the first coat. She didn't understand that. Once we got through with it, she was happy with it. But you can't critique an unfinished product 
And this plan, Moses, the plan that Moses is to carry out, is still in its early stages. And when dealing with people, especially as a leader, you have to constantly remind yourself that you are dealing with people. That's crazy, isn't it? When dealing with people, you need to remind yourself that you're dealing with people. These people, the Israelites that here in the story, for the most part, they're just like us. They get stressed and they get angry. And they fall down on the job and they get distracted. And they have good days and they have bad days. Once again, all things are common among men. We are no different than the people we're trying to lead, the people we're trying to teach, the people we're trying to supervise, or the children we are trying to raise. Just like them. Things almost always get worse before they get better. In order to remodel your house, you have to tear things out of it. In order to have a successful surgery, you have to go through the pain and the recovery process, but the end justifies the pain and the inconvenience. If you are walking according to the will of God, the plan He has for you, then things are going to get bumpy every now and then. We just read it. However, you can go to Him and talk about it, and it won't automatically get easier at that instant, but it will get better eventually because He's going to calm you down. He's going to explain. He's going to say, hey, chill out. You're going to suck it up a little bit here. Things are going to get a little bit bumpy. All right, as you're coming back from the moon and you're in Apollo 13 or whatever, 8 or all those missions, there's a time you hit the Earth's atmosphere and you're getting slammed around and everything and you think, oh my goodness, what have we done? Same thing on the way up. It gets bumpy. And eventually, once you break through, it smooths out. That's the way walking with God works. God was teaching a lesson here to all parties involved. Pharaoh teaching him. Moses, he's teaching him. And all the children of Israel at this point, are everyone is going to school. School comes with tests. But it is easier if the teacher is your dad. And for the Christian, that is the case. The test giver is dad. Abba, father, more literally rendered daddy. And that's what we've got to remember. Our father is running this show. And though it's contrary to modern parenting theories, the days of helicopter parenting and all that sort of thing, as a good parent, he is preparing us for the road rather than trying to prepare the road for the child. And there's a big difference. He's preparing us for the road, not preparing, preparing the road for us. And once again, in all this, you've got to understand as we'll see, His grace continues to shine through. Would y'all bow your heads, please? I'm going to pray here. This is something that uh, is from the Apostle Paul. As he's praying for the church to which he's writing there, he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, I'm praying for us here in this sanctuary, I'm praying that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to Him who is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to Him be the glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever.